All right. How you guys doing? Glad to be before you uh, virtually uh, yet again. Um, I want to thank you guys for your prayers. Uh, if you did not know uh, that my family um, has been infected by the COVID-19 virus. And uh, if your children are afraid, you know, based on what they see right now of how the COVID has uh, aged me, uh, let them know that's not the COVID. <laughs> that's just been pastor, just pastor just been shaving that. He let it grow a little bit, but hey, we, I wanted to look a little winterized as we move closer to Christmas season. But I want to thank you guys for your prayers. And uh, as always, thank God. Can you guys hear me? See? Thank you. And um, just again for your prayers, uh, not only for myself and my family, been uh, very appreciative of um, the messages, the phone calls, um, and all the great tidings. I want to encourage you guys to be safe during this time. Um, continue to hand washing, mask wearing, uh, social distancing. Uh, if you have plans for Thanksgiving, please be conservative. Um, be wise, not only for yourself, but for the, excuse me, those around you. I want to thank you for your support of the Way of Life Church during these times that we live in right now. Um, you have been a blessing to us and allowed us to be a blessing to others. For those of you who are watching maybe for the first time today and would like to uh, be involved in the kingdom work of God here, uh, the means by which you can do so are there on the screen. But if it is your first time um, being able to connect with us, we would love to know about it. So I want you to do something beyond this moment. Um, if you're watching on a social media platform, to either like it or subscribe it. Um, it would be our joy. You can also venture to our website to know more about the Way of Life Church. Uh, let me think, take this time to also uh, thank my brother on last week, uh, Pastor McMeans, and giving us the word on last week. Uh, we're going to be continuing and ending our series today on citizenship. And I want you to have a thought in mind as we go into this last sermon. I want you to think about if you could have anything in life, if you could have anything, what would it be? All right. And maybe you can post that right now. If you could have anything, um, you can post that. Uh, no, 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 not yet. <laughs> post what it is you would like to have in life. And uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Why don't you join with me in prayer as we get ready to go into God's word and ask for his blessing on our time. Uh, Father God in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for just this day and opportunity to say thank you. Uh, we thank you, God, for blessing us with the level of health and strength we have in this moment. And it's our desire, God, to give it to you. Uh, we want to learn from you. We want to hear from you. And we ultimately want to live for you. And I just thank you, Lord, for your truth and the opportunity to know better, as well as the opportunity to live better because of your truth. I pray, God, that you will bless those in the sound of my voice right now to hear your word and to be transformed. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Any of you ever had a, a dream of being an actor? Maybe being in the movies and uh, being on the big screen, as they call it. And, you know, now the big screen has gotten a lot smaller because of the pandemic. But can you imagine giving up everything to go west, maybe to move out to Hollywood and to try to strike it big and to get your name in lights and to one day be in a movie and to one day get notification that you're going to be nominated for an award? 
Can you imagine your excitement, right, of all that hard work, the blood, sweat, and tears, and you're going to be recognized? And maybe when that award comes around, you call your family and friends out, and even if they can't be in the place because of COVID-19, we're going to celebrate after I win this award. Your excitement it would be through the roof. But what if the award was this? This golden raspberry, right? That's an acting award. But what kind of award is it? You know, the nickname for the award is called the Razzie. And Razzies are given not for the best in acting, but for the worst, right? The, the, the one who won this year, the, you know, the worst picture, the, the picture that got the golden raspberry in 2020 was the movie Cats. Yeah. How many of you guys saw Cats, the movie? No. <laughs> right? Now, now, here's the thing. To be nominated for something can be very special, but man, we don't want to just be nominated for anything. We want to be nominated for the right things. And it would be a pretty sad thing to be nominated for a Razzie, right? But here's the thing when you think about the people who get nominated and win the Razzies. When they're in those movies, they don't think those are the worst movies at that time. When they're acting, they're acting their heart out. They don't think that they're doing a bad job at all. And if you thought about the movie Cats, when you were looking at the screenplay, you knew it was a successful Broadway musical. And when you looked at the cast, it had Idris Elba, it had Sir Ian McKellen in it. And you've got big name people going to be in this. And somebody said, hey, can you, you want to sign up to be in this movie Cats? Absolutely. But a bad thing became a bad thing. Even though you put good effort into it, who wants to be celebrated for doing something bad? Well, listen, I don't want to talk about acting. I want to talk about living. That there are things that we can do that we think are good, but they're really horrible. Things that we put a whole lot of effort into and may feel proud about. Only to find out at a much later time is something we should have been ashamed of. And it's something we need to understand today. It's something connected with the concept of glory, right? Glory. That's what we're aiming for. When I was talking about that scenario of having our names and lights, right? Having that name on the walk of fame is about glory. It's about recognition. It's about honor and celebration. But we don't want to have the right understanding of glory if we're going to live a glorious life. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Today we're going to talk for a few moments about the glory of citizenship. We're going to complete our series today with the same focal passage in Philippians chapter 3, verses 17, all the way through the first verse of chapter 4. Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. He says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory in their shame. With minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. In this letter, in this brief portion of truth, he talks within the fellowship of believers about two camps. One being those whom he describes as enemies of the cross and those who he describes as citizens of heaven. Both would 
call Jesus Lord. Both would sing the same hymns and read the same word, but their lifestyle and behavior were drastically different. In this letter of joy, it is the enemies of the cross that would bring Paul to tears. And one of the characteristics of this group or distinguishing between the two groups is an issue about glory. Now glory, it's something that I think it's safe to say we all want. We all want to be celebrated. We all want to be honored. We want to be thought of as the best in something, to be special. We would like to have um, the, the accolades. We would like to have the celebration, even if we're not celebrities. If we can get some way of being celebrated, if I can be even employee of the month, if I can make the dean's list, there's still some sense of glory. If I can get the corner office and whatever it is, it's something about glory. If I can get the likes based on what I post, if I put my image up and I get a lot of uh, positive statements about my appearance, there's a sense of glory. And we like glory. A lot of times it drives us in what we do. But it also can impact us negatively when we don't get it. When we don't get enough likes on the things that we've said or the picture that we posted. Is it because I'm not someone special? Is it because I'm, I don't have value? Is it because I'm not contributing to anything? Am I mundane? Maybe I'm like the Razzie and not the Oscar. And so we can feel real good when we feel like we are receiving glory. And we can feel real down when we're not. And in this passage, there's a group of people who are receiving glory. But what the text tells us, what Paul tells us about this group is they are celebrating not the right thing, but the wrong thing. They glory in their shame. I need you to process that for a moment. Of being happy with the wrong thing. Now, why, why, where would we ever see that? Where would we see that in a moral sense, right? This is written in the Bible. It's from a biblical perspective, from a theological perspective. It's saying that these people are happy about things they shouldn't be happy about. They celebrate what they ought to be ashamed of. How does that work? I want you to think about the last time you told somebody how you let a person that got on your nerves have it. You know, somebody said such and such, they disrespected me and I cussed them out. Right? And there was a little pride about that. There's a little boastfulness about that. That person cut me off and I pulled them in front of them and hit my brakes so hard. And you're telling somebody because there's a little pride in that. There's a little joy in what I did. There's a sense that I did the right thing. Sometimes it's not just about how you treated someone. Maybe it's somebody you, you uh, unfriended in social media. Look what this person did. Listen, I unfriended them. I put them out my life. I don't even know them anymore. And you're proud of that. There's a boasting in that. What if it's a sexual conquest, right? So they see you with somebody, hey, you know, are y'all, <laughs> I don't wanna say too much. And there's a boasting in that. And so things that we can be proud of and things that we can celebrate because it feels right and maybe somebody else says it's right can ultimately be wrong. And y'all, that's a very sad state to be in, to be happy about something that's wrong. It's being happy that says, I won the raspberry. But it's not a raspberry about acting. It's a raspberry about life. It's a raspberry about parenting. It's a raspberry about being a husband or being a wife. And this group of people 
are glorying in things that are shameful. How do we keep from being in that place? Right? So, you know, the obvious answer would be, well, listen, just make sure you know the right things and to celebrate the right things, right? If I'm going to be focused on and pursuing glory in my life, I just need to make sure they're the right things. Well, here, I want you to think about the context of this letter. These people all go to the same church, right? The enemies of the cross and the citizens of heaven. And so they're being taught about the right things. They're being taught what is wrong, but they still find themselves glorying in things that they should be ashamed of. How do you keep from going there? How how do you make sure that your life is on the right side of right? I'm going to give you two reasons, two things you need to do. Here's, Here's the first thing. Don't look for glory. Don't look for glory. I know that that's a negative command, right? You know, to don't look for, for glory. In other words, don't pursue it. Right? Now, that's contrary to everything we grow up thinking in this culture. We think about you need to be looking for some glory. You need to be thinking about a, a, a certain lifestyle so that you can achieve it. Right? Think about that corner office so you can have it. The car you want to drive, the house you want to live, the kind of family you want. And and so we have this idea of glory, and so we want to have that glory to aim for. But I'm going to tell you, don't look for glory. Now, Now, in the text, I just find it just real interesting. When it talks about the glory and their shame, right? What would make someone be joyful about something when it's the wrong thing, right? How how do you even get there? And I'm going to tell you how we get there as human beings. We get there because we have the wrong definition of glory, right? Glory in an abstract sense is about celebration, about honor. And it also can be attributed to the appearance of something. That's something like when we talk about God, God appeared in his glory. It's talking about the magnificence of God. But we can glory in things, right? And we can celebrate and honor things. Now, here's what it is. When we pursue glory, what we attribute glory to is the wrong thing. It doesn't come from God. Whatever we put in that blank comes from somebody other than God. Let me give you some examples. Right? I was talking about in career, right? The corner office. What's wrong with the middle office? Right? What's wrong with an office on the second floor, not the fifth floor? We talk about a house. When is it a glorious house? How many rooms before it becomes, yeah, that's what I want. That, that's where I want to end. You see, there's a definition that we aim for and pursue. And it becomes a moving target as we approach it. Because when you didn't have a car, man, if I only had a car. I remember being in high school wanting a car, right? I had a, I had a scooter. And when other people were riding a bike and I had the scooter, I was the man in the neighborhood. I had a little radio on my scooter and could drive by. Girls want to ride on the scooter. Come on, hop on the back. And that was like middle school. But man, when we got into high school, them girls didn't want to ride that scooter. Mm-mm. Because other folks had cars. And then I wanted a car. And man, when I got a car, some high school people, yeah, they want to ride in a the car. But man, when you got to college, 
what kind of car you had. And it keeps changing. And that's how it is with everything that we pursue when it comes to glory. It is about us. And it's always moving. And when we have this pursuit of glory, you're going to find yourself going in wrong places. Even when you think it's the right way to go. At the end of your life, if you could get what you defined as glory, what would you have accomplished when it's all said and done? In the Bible, Solomon got everything that we would say is glory. He had the wealth, he had the beauty, he had women. He even had wisdom. And he said at the end of it all, it's all vanity. Chasing after the wind. In other words, nothing. And if you're pursuing glory, if you don't have a right understanding of glory, you're pursuing nothing. Now, somebody's thinking, well, wait a minute. What about the things of God? What, what if I am pursuing things connected with God? So I'm not worried about the corner office and all of that, but something with God. You know, myself as a pastor, man, if, I, if I'm pursuing things connected with God, then maybe that is something I should pursue, that kind of glory. But even then, I have a tendency to redefine Glory, even though it's in a more kingdom context, it still has an earthly definition. Right? The big church, the crowds of people, right? The campus and multiple staff and all this kind of stuff sounds just like the world. And so many Christians have fallen into that trap. They look to and they'll find the pastor that talks about their breakthrough. Right? And how you're always on the cusp and God's just waiting to bless you. And sometimes you got to get some people out of your life and move this around. But man, just around the corner, if you keep believing, you keep trusting, you're going to experience that breakthrough. You're going to have that life that you've always prayed for and hoped for. You're going to get all that stuff that you dreamed about. Here's the problem. It's the same definition of glory that the world gives. And you don't see that in the New Testament. Right? What's the breakthrough in the New Testament? Well, that's the glory I actually want you to think about. Right? I, I told you I don't want you to look for glory. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to look forward to glory. I want, you, I want you to process this. Don't look for glory. Look forward to glory. I want you to think about our text for a moment. Going back to our focal passage, right? It says in verse 19, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and, their, and they glory in their shame with mindset on earthly things. Verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Now, I need you to keep paying attention to the word there. Glory shows up twice. When it shows up for the enemies of the cross, it talks about their, glo their glory in their shame, right? But the next time glory shows up in the text, it doesn't show up directly for the citizens of heaven. Glory is attached directly to Jesus Christ. Do, do y'all see that? Look at verse 20. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Right? You got glory with people, and it's not in a good light. But you have looking forward to glory associated with Jesus, and it's in a positive light. Right? Glory of people, shameful things, enemies of the cross. 
but looking forward to the coming of Jesus and his glorious body, positive sense. I need you, I need you to process this. Because he could have easily said, Paul could have easily said, you know, okay, enemies of the cross glory in their shame, but we're citizens of heaven and we glory in our righteousness. No, that's not what he said. Right? Because he doesn't say that citizens of heaven don't do shameful things. Right? Both groups can do some shameful things. Right? Somebody need to hear that right now. Somebody who had their arms and you know folded and was amen and thinking about all the wrong around them, but not paying attention to the wrong that's in them. Both groups can do shameful things, but one is celebrating. While the other recognizes, yeah, I do some shameful things. But one day. I won't. One day, I'm going to be better. One day, all of the flaws and all of the faults in this, in, in, in this body are going to be fixed. And it's when Jesus comes. Citizens of heaven. And from it, heaven, we await a savior who's going to change these lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. This is a the theological term called glorification. Maybe you've heard of glorification. And it's this sense that ultimately believers will be transformed to be like Jesus. I want you to look at the word of God here. When it talks about glorification, 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Ladies and gentlemen, there is your breakthrough. Your breakthrough has a name, and it's Jesus. And so can I preach that God is going to give you a breakthrough? Absolutely. That he's going to break through and make everything better. Change everything. And his name is Jesus. It has nothing to do with an office or the size of your house. But it has everything about who you are as an individual. And what you will become. Bible even tells us when that breakthrough happens, right? We know the breakthrough is associated with Jesus, but when will it happen? Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him. What does it say? In glory. That's the award, ladies and gentlemen. That's the dream. But it's better than a dream. It's a promise. And when I look forward to that, I live forward. Right? That's why I want you to look forward to glory. Right? Some people look in the past. They look at past glory. You remember when we had family reunions and, and you had that great uncle? You know, when people would maybe have some music on in the background and at some point in time, they'd hit on some old songs, right? For those older people in the family reunion who are people like myself now. <laughs> and I remember being at a family reunion and one of my old uncles, one of those songs would come on and they would get up. And they'd say, I know you think I'm old. All y'all young kids, you think I'm old. But back in my day, I used to know how to cut a rug, right? And I didn't know what cut a rug meant until they started moving. And they would start dancing, right? At least dancing in their mind. And that old music would come on. And they're in their mind dancing just like they did 30 and 40 years ago. Right? And they're thinking they're bringing back their youth by showing you, I remember how I could dance. And they think they're moving. 
and they think they look young, but to you, they look even older. <laughs> Trying to move and not doing a whole lot of movement. Right? And, and that living in view of past glory in that moment. But what about the opposite? What if we flip that around? And not uh, uh, getting up and trying to show the world who we were when we thought things were good. But about who we will be when we know things will be good. That's what I mean by looking forward. Because looking forward can help you to live forward. When you think about that transformation, ladies and gentlemen, it's not the way the world describes a glorious transformation. You know, when the world describes a glorious body, it's fit and it's fine, and it's about appearance. But it's not talking about a muscular Jesus. It's talking about an immortal body. And it's talking about an incorruptible body. See, that's why the Bible tells us flesh and blood cannot inherit uh, uh, heaven and the things of God, that we have to be transformed. And that's why the mortal has to put on immortality and the corruptible has to put on incorruption. Because we can't be in paradise with these bodies. Why? Because we would mess paradise up just like we did. Right? If we went to heaven just like we are, we, we are right now with the same character, same mindset, same capacity, heaven wouldn't be heavenly long. But when he shows up, we're going to be changed. And we're going to be like him. The mortal will put on immortality. That means whatever God has in this perfect environment, we'll be able to enjoy forever. But not only will we be immortal, we will be in a character that we can't corrupt what we experience for immortality in our e eternity. So the mortal will put on immortality so we can live forever. But the corruptible will put on incorruption so that we can love forever. And that is the picture of glory. That's what Paul encourages believers to look at. If you ever read Paul's letters, when he is encouraging the saints, you know he doesn't do what a lot of preachers do. He doesn't describe heaven. He doesn't encourage them to talk about, you know, in this suffering, you can look forward to the streets of gold. And you can look forward to the pearly gates. Right? And that's nice. But he aims them to something better. One day, you'll be like Jesus. I want you to process that. He doesn't have you to focus on the streets you walked on. He has you focused on the one who laid the streets of gold as pavement. Not on the pearly gates, but the one who erected those gates. And saying, you will be like him. You know, everything that communicates and promotes change, they'll give you a before and an after picture, a before and an after, right? When it comes to something about your health, if it's a new diet or a new exercise program, they want to promote the before and the after. If it's a remodeling uh, a firm, maybe they deal with construction and remodeling homes, they'll show you a home or what it looked like before and after. Why? Because they want you to see what can happen with you, what we could do for you, what we could provide for you, how we can transform you. And that is the motive for the investment. That is the motive for the sacrifice because I've seen the after pictures. Now they have things with computer programs. If you go into a dental office or even plastic surgery, they can take your face and put it through the program to help you to see what your transformation will look like, right? To get you excited about this endeavor. If it's a whole lot of money, it motivates you. Listen, I gotta get my money together. If it's an exercise program, you start getting everything together. You start changing your diet. All these things start to change because you're looking at what your potential future looks like. 
But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you about your future. Your future is a love so great that he would hang on a cross, not just for my sins, but for your sins. When he didn't have to, but he did it for you and I. I want you to know about your future. It's so great that even the grave couldn't hold him. I want you to think about being able to love with such perfection and such generosity as one who did so for a whole lost world. I want you to know that that is your future in the Lord. That is your after picture. And if my after picture and fitness will have me in the produce section of the grocery store, what is my after picture for eternity have me to do with the people around me in the produce department right now? The people you live with, the people you work with. If I'm going to look like Jesus, man, and be like Jesus, Maybe I can start to live like Jesus right now. Oscar Wilde wrote a book in the late 19th century called The Picture of Dorian Gray. And Dorian Gray was a handsome young man and this artist was painting a portrait. And while he was sitting for this portrait, a wealthy Lord came and was conversing with the artist in the hearing of Dorian Gray. His name was Lord Henry. And Lord Henry was wealthy and lived the way that he wanted. He enjoyed every type of lust and desire. He promoted beauty and looking good and living how you want to. And while Dorian is sitting for this painting and hearing this Lord talk about this lifestyle, he wanted to have this lifestyle and he wished that when this painting was finished, instead of myself aging and becoming old, let the picture age so that I could maintain my beauty and live life for myself. And sure enough, he actually got his wish that the picture would change and would become older, but Dorian Gray would not. But something interesting would happen as Dorian Gray sought to live this selfish lifestyle, this lifestyle that he heard, that as the person lived, it not only affected the age of the portrait, but the quality of the portrait. In other words, the uglier Dorian Gray lived, the uglier the portrait became. And even though he looked good the whole time, even though he was the picture of beauty and health, the inner wickedness would be manifest on this portrait. Until one point he saw how ugly that the portrait was. And he wanted to change so that that picture would be better. And he started to do nice things. He started to do beneficial things for those around him. And he went to go and look at the picture, and the picture was even uglier. And the reason the picture was ugly wasn't because he was doing ugly things, but because he did it for an ugly motive. You see, it wasn't about helping people. It was about changing the picture. And ultimately, Dorian Gray, so exasperated, took a knife and stabbed through the heart of his portrait. And though those in his household heard a loud scream and found Dorian Gray dead on the floor, unrecognizable, hideous and old, and a rip and a portrait of a young, pristine, Dorian Gray. Right? Interesting story. But what if something could have happened in that moment of his greatest need? 
What if someone could have offered a different picture to Dorian Gray? And I'm talking about the ugly Dorian Gray. I'm talking about the one who had the wrong motives and the wrong lifestyle. But as he looked at this picture and he saw kindness and he saw compassion and he saw generosity, that the more he looked at the picture, he started to reflect the picture. That even though he was a horrible person at the time of the picture, the more he looked at it, the better he got. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what God offers you. He offers you through his word a picture that will change who you are. And that picture is of Jesus Christ. And that the more you look to that picture, the more you will become that picture until one day the one who painted the picture shows up. And as the word of God says, listen, you will be just like, as, like him. You will be as he is. So don't look for glory. Look forward to glory. Look forward to glory. And you'll live a glorious life. Father God in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity, God, to speak your truth. To courage a different desire in our hearts. To not simply aim at living better, but looking forward to the better that you will make us to be. I pray, God, for those in the sound of my voice to consider the beauty and the glory of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, God. And I look forward to that day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, if you're watching and you would like to make some step of faith, maybe you want to come to know Jesus Christ better, maybe you want to find a family of believers to connect with, listen, the means by which you can do so, they're there on your screen. You can text the word DECIDED to 62488. Message us on Facebook. You can even go to our website and let us know. But don't sit there in a place of indecision. Make a decision. And it'd be our joy to come alongside you. Listen, I want to thank you guys for taking the time uh, to watch today. And Lord willing, we will see you next week. Same time. Have a great day.